For part two of our fifth interview, Dr. Stephen Lindheim chats with Dr. Stephen Corson. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy what we think are valuable lessons about our history, sparking innovation, and newer surgical applications of reproductive surgery. So what are your feelings on uh, uh, robotic surgery, the robot? Well, well, the China experience, again, uh, after the Gang of Four was, was dethroned, essentially, uh, we were, the AAGL was the first uh, OBGYN organization to be invited to China. And we were invited. This was back in, uh, I think, 1980. And uh, we, I taught endocrinology and laparoscopic procedures. But the, the Chinese said, uh, there's a woman who was sterilized. In China at that time, there was one child and then sterilization. She had been sterilized and her son was hit by a government truck on his bicycle and killed. And they asked me and Jerry Hoffman to uh, reverse her sterilization. So I had fashioned the culposcope into an operating microscope, uh, just tinkered with it a little bit. And it, it was actually pretty good. And we were going to leave all the instruments there that we took. So we went to the OR and in the OR, the, the light, the operating room light was actually the headlamp from a, fo- from a truck. <laughs> and, uh, but the culposcope or this revised culposcope had its own light source. So we uh, did an anastomosis on, on her sterilization. And Jerry and I had a running comedic uh, battle over the years as to which side worked because we got a letter, each of us got a letter from the Chinese government about 18 months later that she had delivered. So that was, that was fun. But the Chinese uh, at that time, they were, they were really excellent students. It was a pleasure to teach them. And you showed them something one time and, and they got it. And that was, that was a phenomenal experience. For the younger listeners uh, that may, may not know it, or at least they've heard of the procedure, uh, GIFT, tell us uh, a little bit about that and how, um, how that transformed uh, surgery or transfer, transformed the IVF world. And then when did you, uh, did you have the foresight that it was going to fall out of vogue? GIFT, meaning gamete intrafallopian transfer, that's the acronym, occurred really because in the early days of IVF, uh, the bottleneck was the, was the ability of the laboratory to nourish the early embryo developmentally. And not all infertility was caused by tubal disease. So that it, 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 it was logical to assume that the body at that time was a better incubator than, than, than the lab. And if you could deposit gametes into the fallopian tube, um, nature was at that time better than the lab. So this led to a laparoscopic approach where you would, you would uh, go in laparoscopically and collect the eggs and mix them with a fresh uh, semen specimen and deposit in each tube or one tube at the fallopian, at the fimbriated end, the gametes. And um, this worked. I mean, we had, if memory serves me correctly, uh, we had about close to a 50% pregnancy rate doing gift. Uh, and we were, and then we quickly realized that there, if you got carried away and you put too many eggs back, you had too many big, heavy time, uh, uh, multiple pregnancies. So we limited it to two or three eggs uh, going back in mixed with the sperm. And that was a, it was a good procedure, but you see the economics were not favorable because you needed an OR and although we did do some under local anesthesia, most of the time they were done, they were done with general anesthesia. So you had the expense of the OR, an anesthetist or an anesthesiologist. And the economically, it didn't, it didn't make much sense. I mean, you, 
he overcame the, the, the incubation in the laboratory, but the economics were not very favorable. Plus the fact that a lot of, in a small institution, uh, you would have trouble scheduling it because it had to be scheduled, you know, as the eggs uh, approached their, their, their maturity, but before they were the shed from the ovary because you had to get them, you know, at a very, at a very small operating window. But what, and it was, when it worked, I mean, it was fine and it was, it was, it wasn't cheap and it was, the scheduling was cumbersome and it fell out of favor in time as the laboratory ability to nourish the early embryo increased. Uh, and then also then we got into cryopreservation so that you could collect a dozen or more eggs, fertilize uh, as many as you, as you could and store the embryos. So that was just a question of the, the laboratory catching up with mother nature to, to some degree. Uh, I remember Kathy, Dr. Go working in that tiny little lab in adjacent to the OR. Uh, right. Boy, oh boy, I remember the I, I remember those times. We've all had to overcome some obstacles or challenges in our career. Um, why don't you elaborate to the audience, you know, maybe one or two, one or two, and how did you overcome them just as suggestive, uh, you know, input for people as they move in their career? Well, the early laparoscopists acquired the tag of cowboys. And this was pejorative, uh, rather, rather than laudatory. And um, it was difficult. It, it took about five or six years to, uh, to get accepted. In the very beginning, it was really difficult to get your things published in, in the major journals. Uh, it was, and it, but in those days also, um, the, the risk management programs that we now have today that are sometimes overly rigid were just coming into vogue. So it was easy to, to be innovative. It was easier then than it is now. As you look back in your career, not the challenge, but what's the biggest surprise that you've uh, that you've seen or uh, or can reflect upon? The, I think the thing that surprised me the most was the um, lack of acceptance for gestational carriers. Hmm. Um, you know, sperm donation in America, at least, has been done for over a century probably. And egg donation was, was accepted pretty, pretty early in the game without too much fuss. But it, it, it seemed to me that carrier gestation was almost a no brainer because the, the, the carrier, the gestational carrier was essentially, not totally, but essentially inert from the pregnancy so that somebody who couldn't have her own genetic baby could have a gestational carrier either paid or not paid because a lot of the gestational carriers that we that we had in our program were actually sister-in-laws and it's true they they weren't ex they weren't exactly inert the placenta leaks in both directions so you had fetal cells entering the maternal circulation. That was known because of the RH sensitization, uh, but apparently of very little harm. And you had maternal cells that went in, in, into the fetus. It went both ways, but it, it, it was not a problem. So I thought that that, uh, that was also called the gestational surrogacy. And I didn't like that term of surrogacy because it, it was confusing with surrogates. So we coined the term gestational carrier, um, but it was the same thing. And I thought it would be really acceptable uh, to the general population, but it wasn't. I mean, and a lot of people never accepted the fact that you could have your own genetic child this way. So that was a, it, it, was, it was a battle. It was disappointing, but we, we did it. And, and it, the program was successful. Uh, it required very 
uh, strenuous, strict psychologic input, uh, particularly with with uh, uh, most of most of the the carriers were women who had been reproductively proven and had their own families, whether they were related or not to the patient. And you had to be careful not to to uh, cause a psychological disturbance within that family. And we were we were pretty scrupulous with it. Andrea Braverman was was really terrific at that at that role. You were are such a creator. Like now today, what do you do? What do you do to stay on top of the literature? What do you do to keep your mind thinking and doing? And how do you continue your creative uh, continue your creativity? Well, after I retired from clinical practice, I edited the JMIG for a decade, and I've been consultant to various uh, companies, uh, instrument design. In fact, I I still do that with with uh, I'm a consultant to to industry. And I read, you know, the major journals, and I, I keep up to date that way. Um, but um, I, I play a lot of I play a lot of competitive bridge. Uh, I think that a lot of I see my friends. A lot of docs are afraid to retire because they've never developed outside interests, and they are afraid that the day they retire, that their brain's going to go soft from inactivity. So um, I've played competitive bridge for, for, for some time. Um, we have our family and my, my grandkids. Uh, uh, I'm interested in, in, in music. And, um, you know, one, one thing that, that maybe we could touch on is the, the whole, the whole thing of, teaching and mentors it's very to mentor people is very gratifying it, whether directly or vicariously to to the mentor and most of us stand on the shoulders of of our predecessors our mentors and i think the mark of a good teacher is the success of the pupils and you know it it it's it's emotionally gratifying when the people that you've taught are successful and happy and, and, and innovative. And I think what that's all about, and it's very important And the role, the role of teaching. Um, there are a lot of people who say, well, it takes time and the, the, and it's the, some of the people are not receptive. And, but those are, those are minor, minor things. I think teaching, we wouldn't be here. If somebody hadn't devoted time and effort to teach us, and it was not just technically, but to teach us the you know the whole the whole thing about medicine. So uh, it actually transitions into the last last part of this uh, this interview here. Three questions: How do you define success? Uh I would define it as, as, as success in general as leaving leaving this life better than what you found it when you entered it. Very well said. And, and what would you want uh, the medical learners today? Even though I think you've highlighted uh, to some degree, but specifically, what would you want to tell the medical learners today? Medicine has always been a, a profession where to be successful you cannot stop the learning process. It's a constant learning process. And for many of us, I think we enjoy both ends of that. We enjoy teaching, certainly, but we also enjoy being a perennial student. At least I do. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to go into a certain field, um, you know, teaching, teaching is, is almost a sacred trust not just for medicine. I mean, I'm very interested in, in music and it's the same thing there. I mean, a teacher should be judged in large part by the success of his or her pupils. So take, take music, for instance. Uh, Nadia Boulanger, a famous teacher. People like Rimsky-Korsakov was taught by her. 
uh, Ravel was taught by her. And, and George Gershwin, who knew nothing, next to nothing, about orchestration, was taught orchestration by Ravel. So there, there are these lines, of, these lineage of, of, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors, many of us do in large part. So teaching, it's, it's like a chain letter. It has, it has to be a continuum to be, that, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, Dr. Corson, please tell us uh, some of uh, your uh, disciples that you've uh, mentored through your career. Well, you you certainly have had a good run, and your <laughs> your run is continuing. So I would put you in that category. Thank uh, you very much, Gary Frischman, uh, up at Brown, who who is uh, associate editor of the JMIG, uh, Jeff Piper, who's chief has been chief out at Indiana. Uh, Mark Woodland, who's uh, chief at Reading Hospital. Uh, Charlie Lockwood is a noted neonatologist and has been department head. Uh, Bethan Powell, a uh, well-known oncologic surgeon, left Philadelphia and went down to Texas and stayed. I remember Bethan was always a very enthusiastic surgeon. She had a, <laughs> she had a glint in her eye whenever... Uh, she went to the OR, and, and she's, she's had a good career. And I'm sure I'm leaving out some, some other uh, people, but um, Jay Cooper, certainly. Jay, yeah. Jay was noted as a hysteroscopist. So those are just some of the people who uh, came out of the Pennsylvania Hospital Program. So what would you want to leave as your legacy? Uh, legacy, I don't know. Um, legacy is not a lot of letters, but it's a big word. It's, it's, a, it's a strong word. I like to just be remembered for being innovative, um, being, being, um, having integrity, uh, compassion for patients. And I'd let it go with that, I'd be happy. Well, I want to say that this uh, has been by far uh, insightful, a pleasure, and I'm really uh, glad that you uh, took the time uh, uh, to do this uh, with me and also for all of our viewers and uh, readers. It is immensely appreciated. Well, Stephen, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the, the opportunity to, to do this.